David Green and myself went to film school together, and one game we would always play all the time because we're big film nerds is we would come up with the title of a movie and then try to figure out what that movie is about. And one night, late at night shooting, David said, "Your Highness, you're in it. What's the what's the movie about?" And so quickly, I was like, "Well, what could be Your Highness about?" Uh, all right, it's about a knight who gets stoned and fights dragons. Shall we pack this again? I, I'm not getting visions. I'm not sure if it's working, wizard. And that was kind of where it came from. The movie started as a joke, and it has finished as a major motion picture. Sounds tedious and boring. Fantasy and comedy are two genres that, when done right, can be married perfectly together. Marriage is what brings us together today. The gold standard is, of course, The Princess Bride. There are plenty of other examples, from Monty Python all the way up to Shrek. But in recent memory, most fantasy movies and shows seem to be more concerned with mimicking the Game of Thrones model and telling grand epic stories instead of just having fun with their lore and characters. So when the first trailers came out for Your Highness back in 2010, I was really enthused. A fantasy stoner comedy written by the creators of Eastbound and Down, with the director of Pineapple Express at the helm? Count me in. Add in a solid supporting cast as well as practical creatures, and Your Highness looked to be a refreshing take on both genres. No. It's something we haven't really seen since Teach and Chong with the Corsican brothers in 1984. In the beginning, like all men, they were born. But from then on, all similarities ended. Cheech and Chong are the Corsican brothers. Sometimes it's when all the components for success are there on paper that a movie fails the hardest, though. You have a sword stuck so far up your butthole that you cannot even enjoy yourself for one moment. Your Highness was critically ravaged upon its release. Roger Ebert called it juvenile excrement that feels like the work of 11-year-old boys in love with dungeons, dragons, warrior women, pot, boobs, and four-letter words. The only thing those tits will trap is my warm spray. I saw the movie opening weekend, and even I, an 18-year-old at the time, and surely this movie's target demographic, was really disappointed. Disappointed! I haven't revisited it since, but the movie always stay with me because of just how much I wanted it to be good especially because it boasted an original story spearheaded by talented filmmakers who had produced quality work prior. You gotta break the door! Are you gonna pay for it? <laughs> it's happened quite often that I have disliked a movie the first time I saw it, but came to appreciate it years later. Sometimes our anticipation of a movie skews things and makes for an unfair first viewing. You're just being jealous. Shit! Oh, so let's journey back to a time when the Kingdom of Apatel was truly thriving, and crass, never-ending improv was defining every single comedy movie. This video is sponsored by Electronic Arts. While today's video is about a fantasy movie that lacks lore, our sponsor breathes new life into fantasy's greatest lore, in Lore of the Rings Heroes of Middle-Earth a new tactical turn-based CRPG that brings your favorite characters from J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle-earth to life like never before. It's a great game that gives you the opportunity to create your own squad made up of the series' most legendary characters, like the powerful Lord Elrond. Legendaries distinguish themselves from all the other iconic characters currently in the game, offering players a unique new gaming experience like no other, and Elrond is no exception. Building off of an already impressive slate of Middle-earth's finest, Elrond will enhance your roster with his ability to instantly heal, as well as revive allies. Be sure to collect five elven characters before his legendary adventure event starts on June 26th. Even if you missed the window for this incredible event, there are still tons of exciting Lord of the Rings characters to collect, and stories to forge. Relive iconic moments from Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, or create your own right now. Download Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-earth for free using the link in the description, or by scanning the QR code with your phone. I can't think of another comedy actor that has grown in his craft the way Danny McBride has. His rise to fame seemed to happen overnight, after Adam McKay and Will Ferrell acquired the low-budget indie comedy The Foot Fist Way in 2006. How many slices have you had, Julio? How about you've had enough? I'm going to here, I'm paying for you to stuff your face. One year, he was starring in an independent movie made for less than 80 grand, and the next year, he was acting alongside comedy's biggest superstars and holding his own. 
Mother Nature just pissed her pants, dude! Before long, he was also writing and starring in his own comedy TV series, Eastbound and Down, for HBO. You remember the class where I taught you all how to make it rain? That's what I'm gonna be doing every single night. Dollar, dollar bills, y'all. But as quickly as fame came to him, McBride never lost his grip on playing the bumbling everyman, characters who were sometimes crass, but who always strive to be successful. This little travel mug I like to call the perfect woman. Big old set of boobies, no head, and a handle. Mm -mm. His character in Your Highness, named Thaddeus, is no exception. The greatest sword fighting man ever lived. Thaddeus is the son of the King of Morn, and despite his royal blood, constantly finds himself getting into trouble. He'd rather be found smoking with the local trolls instead of attending his duties in the kingdom, much to the embarrassment of his father the king, played by Charles Dance. No one does anything special for me when I do extraordinary things. Oh, what extraordinary things have you done of late? Do tell me, enlighten me. His brother, the dashing Fabius, played by James Franco, is the favorite son, who returns triumphant from his latest heroic quest, having rescued his new bride, Belladonna. I'm sick and tired of everyone sucking upon your tits because you ought to become king. All the while, no one gives two turtle shits about me. When she is captured by the wizard Lazar on their wedding day, the king demands that Thaddeus join his brother on the quest to save her. Father, you can't be serious! If you want me to go on to a quest, then let's start with something easy, like boiling a chicken or beating off in front of a pegasus. Elementary things. This type of sibling rivalry is commonplace in a fantasy story like this, only here they don't really take advantage of the rivalry. Oh my god, I've missed you so oh god, great and cool. Fabius has an almost unjustified adoration for his brother that is never really explained, an odd choice considering Thaddeus is an ass to everyone around him, especially his brother. I want you to be gay with me and father. I don't want to be gay with you too. Whether it's the way it was written or in the bright-eyed innocence Franco seems to bring to the part, it makes for a sibling dynamic that ultimately goes nowhere. Mary looks stupid in front of all your friends. And don't think I'm not telling father because I'm going to. Thaddeus, we were just having some fun. Instead of Fabius blindly supporting his brother, I want to see him just as annoyed that he's being forced to work with Thaddeus as Thaddeus is annoyed to be there with him. Come, brother. This is the first stop on your first quest. We shall go together. The movie comes really close to giving us that, with Thaddeus later revealing that he is only the way he is due to the fact that everyone in the kingdom worships his brother. They only say that stuff because of you, because you go out and have to pretend to be the best, and they look at me like I'm some sort of idiot. But it only comes up in this one scene, and it's never really addressed again. Everybody is really trying to do what, you know, what their characters believe in, and, and, and so nobody breaks the spell of the world, even though, in other ways, it's a comedy and very funny. Oh, wow. You gotta be shitting me. <laughs> Danny McBride's characters are at their best when they have a more straight-laced counterpart, with the comedy coming from the contrast between the two. Doing a lot of running and uh, cycling, swimming. Well, you know all about that. <laughs> no, actually, I don't. I play real sports. Not trying to be the best at exercising. But Franco tries to play his role just as silly as McBride at times, which really undercuts the humor and prevents the two of them from finding a chemistry that works. And you guys have amazing chemistry, I have to tell you. I mean, you guys are so funny up there together. Thank you. <laughs> You're not much for talking, are you? It makes me wish a more experienced dramatic actor had played the role of Fabius. Maybe like Orlando Bloom, who could have played the part completely seriously in contrast to Danny's acting style. What's your problem? Why are you such a sourpuss? I understand why Franco was cast after the huge success of Pineapple Express, but another actor would have aided the concept better, I think. Uh, even with the casting choices, we, we just always felt with this movie, the more serious we took the movie, the funnier the comedy was. It's up in your vagina. That's where my penis will go after the wedding. Mm. <laughs> I mean, in Pineapple Express, Franco is the silly one, giving Seth Rogen the chance to play things straight, and their relationship works really well in that movie as a result. I'm a process server, so I have to wear a suit. Wow, you're a servant? Like, a butler? A chauffeur? No, no, what? But here you have two lead characters just trying to be silly and goofy, and there's no contrast. Why would you say that? Because, Fabius, it's true. Another performance that comes off just a little too silly is Justin Thoreau as Lazar. And if your vagina is anything like my hand, there will be no problem. Uh, even with the casting choices, we, we just always felt with this movie, the more serious we took the movie, the funnier the comedy was. He's very clearly having a lot of fun in the role, 
but the villain here again need to be played seriously to up the stakes. I don't tell you what to do with your money, don't f***ing tell me what to do with mine, okay? In a high concept comedy like this, the world supporting characters should be played completely straight, with Thaddeus being the outlier. Let's look at a movie that proved this close to a century ago, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Now I know I come back to this movie a lot, but I have to again because it's just such a perfect example. When two genres are threaded together in a story like this, they each need to be played true. Here, the Universal Monsters are played just as seriously as they had been in their previous movies, while Abbott and Costello show up to do their usual shtick in their scenes. The result is a unique blend of styles that respects both genres and gives each of them their time to shine. Hey, you'll have to get your dog away from the phone. I can't hear a word you're saying. Obviously, there are more modern examples of this type of blend, but this one really set the standard. All the monsters and villains and supporting characters really should have been played like it was this great epic fantasy, than just having these few comedic characters sprinkled in. When there is a great fantasy monster or creature introduced here, they quickly become just as goofy and crass as Thaddeus. You want us to twist what is long with our sensitive hands? Just punch the tip and twist it. Yes, but we are not going to do that. When McBride is acting alongside Charles Dance, or Toby Jones for instance, it's a lot of fun because you have this regal, well-spoken performer pitted against McBride's crude delivery, and it really works. Good evening, your royal highness. Julie. Hello, f***ing Julie. <gasps> Natalie Portman, who shows up way too late in the movie, plays the warrior Isabel, and she also plays things pretty straight, allowing McBride to play off her in a way that works. My only advice would just be to keep your head up, hang in there, live every day to the fullest, have sex as much as you can by campfire when you're all alone and your brother is out gathering wood. That's kind of the heartbreaking thing here, is there's a lot of good seeds and scenes that do work, but they're often overpowered by the elements that don't. <laughs> no! That's also the case with the wonderful soundtrack and location photography in Ireland. Both of these elements really enhance the movie and make the world here feel really authentic. But then we'll go from a really majestic scene to something like this. Here's a good idea. Have a point. Again, when you look at something like The Princess Bride, where there's silly material, it's delivered completely earnestly by the performers. No tricks, no weapons. Skill again, skill wrong. You mean... You'll put down your rock and I'll put down my sword and we'll try and kill each other like civilized people? This way the humor still lands without the need to exaggerate or be crass. Evidently most of this movie was improvised with the script merely serving as a blueprint, and it shows. And he takes sperm on him and gives it to women freely, spilling his seed willy-nilly as he makes his way through that orgy. I mean, David Gordon Green even admitted that they didn't even attempt to craft jokes which is just baffling. I don't think we've ever approached this as a typical comedy in terms of putting in jokes or setup and payoff or a lot of the typical comedic structure. We wanted to put together a movie that kicked ass and had great creatures and awesome action and relationships and adventure and romance and all those things. And then weave fun comedic opportunities out of that. Oh, wow. You gotta be shitting me. <laughs> Instead of having clever dialogue drive the story, we get countless scenes of actors just stringing crass words together in the hopes that it will be enough to carry the comedy. And it grows really old. Doesn't it make his head look like the tip of a penis? <laughs> it's hilarious. It was more or less just heavy petting with a brief moment of penetration. I heard that he has fungi on his genitalia as a result. Whoa, Suck it whoa, right there! Whoa. Yes, I know, but what if he but her? The cold air licking your tits. Fart and then weave fun comedic opportunities out of that. You fool! It's such a shame because you can really see the influence of those great 1980s fantasy epics on the story here, but the fantasy elements are played too goofy. When I was younger, we'd take our shirts off and jump on the bed. Playful secrets. <laughs> Don't tell father. And the comedy just wasn't really there to begin with. It seems like they had a really great idea and title to do this stoner comedy set in a fantasy world. But instead of actually being clever, they just figured having these actors show up, improv, and say a bunch of crass dialogue would be enough. Guess what? I despise you. You're a bully and a whore. 
The movie is at its best when the lore and world are depicted seriously, and then having Thaddeus come in with his crude reactions. Danny McBride is a lot of fun to watch here, but without those scenes to contrast his character from the others, none of his jokes land the way they have in his other films. The idea to combine the fantasy and stoner comedy genres should have resulted in a truly original film. Instead, we just get the standard unleashed improv comedy like the worst movies of this era. Why are you making me look bad? There is a silver lining, however, in that McBride kept growing and evolving as a storyteller, eventually making the leap to directing himself. Your Highness kind of was born from the movies we grew up on that we loved a lot, like uh, everything from Conan the Barbarian to Deathstalker, Kroll, Dragon Slayer, these sort of, uh, you know, these 80s fantasy action movies. And, uh, you know, we just kind of wanted to do our take on one of those films. Sometimes it's suggested that instead of remaking acclaimed movies, studios should revisit concepts that didn't land the first time. And this is honestly something I would love to see attempted again. I look forward to hearing about it. Good luck and goodbye.